Well, we've been thinking so far about our hope of heaven. And Christians rightly look forward to the joys and the glories that God has prepared uh, for his people in heaven. And truly, we will be at home with the Lord. Not just present with the Lord, but at home where we truly belong. And those truths should delight our hearts. And we ought to think much of them. The world derides uh, our Christian hope, doesn't it, as pie in the sky, and uh, we, we can sometimes feel almost embarrassed in believing in these things, and we shouldn't, because these are realities, and they ought to delight us, they ought to encourage us in our Christian walk. And yet even what we have thought about so far is not all that God has for his people. We have a Christian hope beyond even heaven. Uh, and as I often uh, would say to our own folk, for the Christian, the best is still to come. Uh, and even heaven doesn't exhaust that best that God has for us. Our hope is not just of disembodied life in heaven and the intermediate state, wonderful as that will be, but it is for eternal life, body and soul, in the new creation. Because God saves people. Now, we do, I suppose, often talk about saving souls. But in truth, God saves people. People who have bodies as well as souls. No part of us is going to be discarded in the glories that the Lord has prepared for his people. And that's the, the, the full hope uh, to which we are to look forward. Not just heaven, but the new creation. And so we want to move on to think of uh, these things, uh, in a sense, what follows heaven. Uh, and we're thinking of the words uh, of the Lord in Revelation 21, 5, I am making all things new. And that is the goal of our faith and our hope. God will make all things new. And there are several aspects of that fuller hope that uh, we want to think about. Now, there's much more we could say. Uh, we're really just looking at some of the, the, the key aspects of uh, our hope. I want to think, first of all, of the Savior's return. The Savior's return. John 14, verse 3, Jesus promised, I will come again and will take you to myself. He is coming back. Now, perhaps sometimes, particularly as Reformed folk, we don't think about the return of Christ as much as we ought. Maybe part of the reason uh, is that there are some wildly speculative ideas about Christ coming back and uh, taking out of the biblical text things that I believe aren't really there. And perhaps our tendency then is to, to shy away from uh, the return of Christ and not talk much about uh, the second coming. I can remember uh, visiting in a, a home of a, a godly family. I was preaching in a congregation many years ago, uh, and suddenly they started talking about uh, the judgment at the great white throne and how this was different from the last judgment, and what did I think of this? And I was floored, I would have to say. But the comment was made at the end of that conversation that has stuck with me. Uh, and they said, we don't hear anything about these things in our church. Uh, and sadly, I think that probably was accurate. But if we avoid the subject of the return of Christ, we, we leave folk wide open to every theory and every idea and every speculation. Uh, and what people need is solid uh, biblical truth. There are things we don't understand, things the Bible hasn't revealed, maybe if God had told, them about, told us about them, we wouldn't understand them, but he's told us what we need to know. And central to our Christian hope is the Savior's return. Focus must always be on the Lord Jesus Christ. And several things just to say about uh, the Savior's return. And the first thing is it's certain. It is absolutely certain Acts 1, 11, disciples are looking up into heaven. They've seen Jesus ascend. And the angel says to them, really, why are you standing looking into heaven? 
This same Jesus will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. He will come. No doubt about it. Not he might or we think he will. He will come back. And the final uh, stages of God's redemptive plan can't fail any more than any other aspect of the saving work of God can fail. And so we can be absolutely certain that Christ is coming back. And the victory that Christ has won in his death and resurrection must be seen and it must be acknowledged by all. Those who believe in him and delight in his return, those who reject him and will be terrified by his return, but they will acknowledge that he has come back. It's certain. There need be no doubt in our minds Christ will return. It's also personal. It's Christ himself who's coming back. And that should delight our hearts to know the Savior himself uh, will return just as he departed. Uh, Again, the, the, the angel's word to the disciples. He'll come back in the same way. He will come back. It is the personal return of Christ, and he's coming to complete the work of salvation. And Paul can write then in Philippians 3.20, we eagerly await a Savior from heaven. Eagerly await. It's not just a theological truth that we may argue about and speculate about. It's eager waiting. That should characterize the Christian as we think about the return of Christ. We will meet our glorified Lord in our resurrection bodies, and we'll think about that in a moment. It's a certain return. It's a personal return. Christ himself is coming back to complete our salvation. It's a visible return. And again, You see that in the angel's message. We will see him as the disciples saw him go into heaven. Uh, There there is no support anywhere in the Bible for a a secret return of Christ, as some of the cults believe in, uh, or a a return that will be visible only to some, perhaps just to Christians. He's coming, we're told in Revelation 1-7, with the clouds and every eye will see him even those who pierced him. What a thought. Even those who pierced him will see him return. Now for many of them, what a horrendous prospect to see the one they pierced face to face. They praise God. We think of the centurion at the cross, saved by grace, who will welcome the returning Savior. There's one who pierced him and yet in the grace of God transformed faith in the returning Christ. But it will be visible. Every eye will see him. The entire universe, the angels, the demons, every person who has ever lived will see the return of the glorified Savior. There will be no doubt that this is the second coming of Christ. There'll be no discussion. Do you think this is it? Could it it be another event? There'll be no doubt. It's certain, it's personal, it's visible, and it's glorious. It's glorious. The first coming of Christ, you know, of course, was in obscurity. It was in humiliation. He made himself nothing, as Paul says in Philippians 2, 7. Humbled himself to the lowest place. Shared our nature with all the, the weaknesses Uh, of the human body, the only difference, the absence of sin in Christ. He humbled himself to the lowest place, humbled himself to death, Paul says, even death on the cross. And you think of the vision in Isaiah 53, that people saw him and there was no beauty that would desire him, despised and rejected. That's his first coming. How different in his second coming. The, The veil will be drawn back. One of the the words that's used in the New Testament for the return of Christ uh, is apocalypse. And the idea is the the taking back really of a curtain that was hiding his glory. And he will come in radiance and splendor. The veil will be removed. Coming in the clouds of heaven 
with power and great glory. That's how Jesus himself described his return as he sat there at the temple with his disciples. Clouds of heaven speak of deity and power and great glory. All the radiance that was hidden for a time in his first coming will shine forth for all to see. No hiddenness. How amazing when John writes 1 John 3 2, we will see him as he is. We will see his glory, as much of his glory as, as we can cope with. And I suggest that his full glory would be more than we could ever uh, encompass. But we will see him as he is, and we will be transformed. We will be like him because we will see him as he is. Again, the, the personal significance and impact of the return of Christ. Again, it's not simply a, an abstract piece of theology. This means us. We will be transformed into that likeness. We will share in the radiance of the returning Christ. The Savior's return. We should look forward to that return. Don't let the confusion of different ideas and prophecy and different speculations put you off thinking about meditating on the return of Christ. It should delight your heart. This is your future. You know, so much of the future we can't see. We don't know what tonight will bring, never mind tomorrow. But we know with absolute assurance our Savior is coming back and we will see him and we will be like him. And salvation will be completed. The Savior's return. Bound up with that then, secondly, is the glorious resurrection. The glorious resurrection. We are united to Christ in his death and resurrection. Uh, and Paul expounds that particularly uh, in Romans 6. A wonderful uh, passage about how we die with Christ, we rise with Christ, spiritually speaking. In a certain sense, uh, spiritually, we go through the same process that Christ has gone through on our behalf. We die, we rise. It's in Christ. He died for us. He rose for us. And we're united to him and we'll never be separated from him. And so our bodies will share in the glory that the Lord gives us. We have eternal life. And our bodies will share in the fullness of the salvation of the eternal life that the Lord has given us. That's what Paul writes. If we have been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his, Romans 6, 5. And I encourage you, read Romans 6, see the implications of being united to Christ in his death and resurrection. And that's the foundation for the glories that you and I are looking forward to. We're united to Christ and we'll be fully transformed into his likeness and share his glory. So already, if we're Christians, we have risen to new spiritual life in Christ. That's why we are told uh, that we have passed from death to life. And it's the ultimate one-way ticket. We have passed over and we're not going back. So we have risen to new spiritual life, but more lies ahead. We will rise to new bodily life at the return of the Savior. Because he has risen, we must rise. There is no possibility uh, that, that anything else could be ahead of us but resurrection. If Christ is risen and we are united to him, we also will rise. And again, you see, again, we're talking of certainties. Uh, we don't need to be thinking, I wonder will that happen? Uh, or can we be sure of this? Yes, we can. If Christ is risen, if you are in Christ, you will 
rice. He is the guarantee. And that's the language that Paul speaks in that magnificent 15th chapter of 1 Corinthians, that chapter about the resurrection. Christ is described there in verse 20 as the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. There, there's one of those texts that speak of death as sleep that were mentioned earlier. The first fruits. What were the first fruits? They were the first part of the harvest that were brought into tabernacle and later to the temple. And the first fruits were a token that the rest of the harvest was coming. It was ready to be gathered in. When you saw the first fruits, you knew the harvest is coming. No doubt about it. It's about to be gathered in. The Lord Jesus Christ is the first part of the resurrection harvest. He has already risen. And that guarantees the gathering in of the full crop. It's only a matter of time until the rest of the resurrection harvest is gathered in. We rise in Christ. We must rise to glory. And the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ is the guarantee that every child of God will rise. You cannot take the resurrection out of the Christian faith and be left with anything. Without the resurrection that liberal scholars and others from time to time have denied, that doesn't matter. If there's a body, if there's dust in a tomb in Israel somewhere, it doesn't matter. Friends, if there is the dust of Jesus in a tomb in Israel, there is no Christian faith. And there is no hope for us. We might as well go home tonight and get on with our lives. Because there is no future for us. And praise the Lord, there is. The hope and the certainty of resurrection glory like our Savior. United to him inseparably. What a prospect. And it's fascinating that Paul in Romans 8 describes the resurrection as the completion of our adoption as children of God. Now, maybe we're puzzled at first because aren't we children of God? Isn't that what uh, John tells us in his first letter, chapter 3? We are children of God. Yes, wonderfully, we are adopted children of God. And there's still more because our bodies are included in that adoption. And the completion of that work, that blessed work of the Lord, requires the redemption of our bodies. Romans 8, 23. It completes our adoption. We are fully, body and soul, the children of God for all eternity. And the resurrection equips us for glory. We're reminded in 1 Corinthians 15 that this mortal body must put on immortality. It needs to be transformed, to be fitted for the life of the age to come, life in the new creation. It is a change that must take place to equip us for what God has prepared. And you see, the reversal of the curse that God pronounced on the creation in Eden and the curse on the human race, you will return to dust. The body would return to the dust from which it was taken. Ultimately in Christ, that body will be transformed and glorified and restored, and we will have bodies for all eternity. At no point does Satan triumph. He doesn't get our souls, and he doesn't get our bodies. There is not one shred of victory allowed to Satan in the salvation Christ has prepared for us. Now there is, of course, there's a lot that remains mysterious about the resurrection body. And I've met people on occasion who are just fascinated by the resurrection body. And almost they would cross the, the, the seven seas to, to, to get another book about the resurrection body. And the truth is, there is a lot that we just do not understand. 
and we can't. And God has told us as much as we need to know and in all likelihood as much as we can understand. What we do know is that the damage done by the fall, by the entrance of sin, will be undone. It will be reversed by the power and grace of God. And whatever we don't know about the resurrection body, we know this. Philippians 3.21 Christ will give us bodies like his glorious body. And we see a little bit in the gospel records of the resurrection body of Christ. It would seem he could appear in locked rooms, he could disappear, and so on, new powers. Who knows what new capacities our resurrection bodies will have? You know, will we all be incredible athletes? Will we all be super intelligent? Who knows? It'll be fascinating to find out. But we'll have bodies like his glorious body. That's enough for us to know. And all the questions we have, many will be answered. And if there are not answers to some of our questions, it won't bother us. We'll be happy to spend eternity without the answers. Because what we have will be so surpassingly marvelous. The Savior's return. The glorious resurrection. Third thing is the final judgment. Final judgment. There's something in every person that seeks justice, that longs for justice. You look out in a world where there is injustice of all kinds, and we see some of the oppression and the suffering in the world, and it burdens our hearts. We long for injustice to be righted, don't we? Why? Because made in the image of God, there is that sense of right and wrong, justice and injustice that even the fall hasn't destroyed. A desire for justice. And that desire for justice will be satisfied. At the last day, it will be satisfied fully. Paul preached in Athens, Acts 17, 31, God has fixed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed. Christ will return as judge. He will come to judge all people. And perhaps our first thought is, that's a fearful prospect. We're told in 2 Corinthians 5.10, we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each one may receive what is due for the deeds done in the body. You think, that is a frightening prospect, isn't it? Here we are, we're Christian folk, we have sought to live for Christ, and we're going to stand before him and account for all our sins. How could you not think of that day with terror? How could you look forward to that day? It seems an incredibly daunting prospect. And if we've been saved and our sins are forgiven, how can we appear to give account to the judge of all the earth? We're told in John 5, 24, whoever believes in Christ does not come into judgment. Is there not a, a conflict there? John 5, we don't come into judgment. 2 Corinthians 5, we all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. Is there a, a contradiction? Well, there isn't. There are no contradictions in the Word of God. There's no contradiction with regard to this final judgment. Our sins are covered by the blood of Christ. There is absolutely no doubt about that. The, the glorious proclamation of Romans 8, 1, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. We must not lose sight of that wonderful proclamation of our freedom in Christ. There is no condemnation. So whatever our appearing before Christ at the last day, before his judgment seat, it will not involve condemnation. It cannot. Or the whole work of Christ would be thrown into question. 
And when we appear before the judge, our sins will be seen purely as forgiven sins. And we will rejoice in the grace of God in Christ that forgave those sins. And they will not bring a burden of guilt and condemnation, but it will rejoice our hearts. The Lord forgave those sins. Every one of them covered by the blood of Christ. There will be no condemnation. And it will redound to the glory of the grace of God in Christ. We do not need to fear appearing before the judgment seat of Christ if we are in him. Our sins will be seen as forgiven and cleansed by the blood of Jesus. And our hearts will be filled with praise and thanksgiving that the Lord did such a work for us when we see the extent of our sin in a way we will, I suggest, never have seen it before. And to see it as forgiven and cleansed. And we think, what a Savior. What grace forgave those sins. So why do we appear in the last judgment at all? What is the point of our appearing before the judgment seat of Christ? It's not for condemnation. It is not to load guilt on us. Why then do we appear? What's the point of it? I think there are several reasons at least we can see in the Bible. For one thing, it will be a demonstration of God's justice. Because there at the judgment seat of Christ we will see the righteousness of God forgiving the sins of those who are united to the Lord Jesus Christ. God will be seen to be righteous and gracious when we appear before Christ. If God were to punish the sins of believers, he would be punishing them twice because already they've been punished in Christ at the cross. So if we were punished again at the last judgment, the same sins would be doubly punished. It would be injustice. And so when we are acquitted, we will see this is justice because already Christ has taken our punishment. The judge has taken our punishment, served our sentence. And we will praise the righteous, just God. Appearing before the judgment seat of Christ also will be the time when degrees of reward are meted out to Christians. Now, every reward is by grace. We must never lose sight of that fact. We don't put God in our debt. He doesn't owe us. And he loves us so much, he rewards his people for doing what we should have done in the first place. That's grace. And it's abundant grace. And we are shown in the scriptures there will be degrees of reward. Now, from this side of glory, we may be inclined to think, well, will we not be discontent? I mean, if he gets more reward than I do, uh, will I not sort of feel aggrieved by that? And the fact is, in glory, in perfection, We will not envy others. We will not in any sense uh, feel that there's injustice in God in giving one this reward and another a different reward. And all the rewards are tokens of the grace and the love of God anyhow. So uh, appearing in the last judgment before Christ demonstrates God's justice. It reveals the degrees of reward for his people. uh, And it officially, as it were, assigns our final place of blessedness in the new creation. We know where we're going. And in a sense, as we appear before the judgment seat of Christ, the Lord is formally, officially telling us that now we enter the new creation in the fullness of the glory he has prepared for us. The final judgment, not to be feared 
by believers. I think sometimes the, the, the idea some Christians may have of the final judgment is we'll be brought up one by one and everybody will be watching and listening and all your sins will be listed and everybody will hear it. And the people you offended and the people you sinned against and they'll all hear how you were angry, how you hated, how you mistreated. And that would be a fearful prospect. But it would appear, I believe, that the judgment for each one of us will be simultaneous, instantaneously. Nobody is going to be sitting listening to the list of your sins. The Lord will deal with each one of his people personally, all together. There'd be no concern of anyone else what your sins were between you and the Lord and those sins, forgiven sins. So some of the caricatures in the minds even of Christians sometimes are not helpful. They, they may confuse us about the last judgment. It is not a day to be feared because it's a day when the grace of the Lord in Christ will be manifest to the entire creation. All will see. All will know. And those who thought of Christians as idiots, as misguided, as fools, will see finally they in Christ are not the fools. And we'll be vindicated before the entire creation. The angels, the demons, the unsaved, our brothers and sisters in Christ. And we will see every one of us the fruit of the grace of God in Christ. The Savior's return, the glorious resurrection, the final judgment, and finally, finally, the new creation. The new creation. Satan, as we mentioned earlier, will not win a victory at any point. He will be defeated completely. There will be no shred of victory left to him with regard to the people of God. We still can sing Psalm 24, 1. The earth is the Lord's. He has not given it up. The material creation is not in the devil's hands. It's in the hands of our God. And he will not let it go. And the enemy will not compel God to scrap this creation. It would mark some kind of victory for the enemy if that were to be the case. If God simply scrapped this creation and had to make a new one. But he will not. The, the, the creation itself will be delivered from the damage that sin and Satan have done. The creation will share in the redemption that's been provided by God's elect, for God's elect. Romans 8, 20, 21, remind us that at present God has subjected the material creation to what it calls futility because of man's sin. And you look at the creation still, there are beauties in the creation, but there are the thorns, there are the thistles, there's death, uh, there's suffering, there are the earthquakes, the tsunamis, and so forth. But that will not continue. Paul goes on, God has subjected the creation to futility in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. And Paul is telling us when the children of God are glorified, when we receive the fullness of our adoption, the material creation will share in that glory. And that will mark the completion of the redemptive work of the Lord Jesus Christ. When Christ returns along with the resurrection of believers, this present creation will be transformed. It will not be destroyed. It will be renewed. 
any more than we are destroyed when we're saved and clones of us are created. Of course, we are renewed, we're transformed, and the material creation will be renewed, it'll be transformed. We're looking for new heavens and a new earth, and the word that's used is not for a brand new creation. It is a renewed creation. Perhaps we should use that term more. We're looking forward to the renewed creation when Christ comes back again. And in perfected bodies, God's people will inhabit a perfected universe. Where will we live in our glorified bodies and our perfected spirits? We will dwell in the new creation. And so Peter writes to Peter 3.13, according to his promise, again, certainty, According to his promise, we are waiting for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. What a prospect, a renewed creation, fitted for the glorified saints to dwell with Christ in all the perfection that will exceed Eden. It'll be Eden multiplied many, many times. Now, of course, there is a lot that we can't understand about the new creation. There'll be a lot about it. We won't know until we get there. Inevitably so. But it will be a perfect home for God's people. It will surpass Eden. It will satisfy everything about the nature God has given us. Do we love beauty? It'll be beautiful. Do we love music? There will be sound. It'll not be a silent world. It'll be filled with music. It'll be filled with animal life in all its multiplicity, in all its richness. It'll be sound and color and beauty exceeding anything we could ever have imagined. We'll probably spend a lot of our time saying, I never thought it'd be like this. Did you think? No, no, I didn't. Couldn't imagine it. It will be glorious. And what will be the most glorious thing? 1 Thessalonians 4.17 We will always be with the Lord. There are days, aren't there, when he feels distant. We've sinned. We're hiding behind a tree as Adam did sometimes. The days when our fellowship isn't what it should be and we know it isn't. In the new creation, there will not be one moment when the Savior feels distant. Not one moment when we're tempted to think we've drifted out of his sight. He doesn't love us as much today as he maybe did yesterday. Perfect fellowship with the Lord, the fullness of covenant life and fellowship with the Lord. All through Scripture, God says, I will walk among you and be your God and you will be my people. That's the new creation. Whatever else there will be to delight in, that is our greatest joy. We'll always be with the Lord. Make sure you'll be there. Make sure you'll be there. If you're not in Christ, by putting your faith in him, you will not be there. And all that we've talked about will be outside your experience. You'll enter eternity in your sin under the wrath of God that will never end. And it need not be so. Saviour calls all who will come, come to him. And he saves all who come in repentance and faith. There is no other entrance to the new creation. There's no back door into glory. You must come through Christ and Christ alone. There's glorious prospect for believers. 
but only when you're in Christ. Make sure you will be there. And once again, God in his grace and his love has given you the opportunity, if you haven't come to Christ as yet, another opportunity to believe in the Lord Jesus and be saved. You might never get another, but you'll have no excuse. If you never heard it before, you heard it tonight. Make sure you're there. And if you know the Lord Jesus Christ, think much about these things. Don't let the world's talk of a pie in the sky put you off. Think of these wonderful things and give Christ all the praise, all the glory. We will always be with the Lord. I hope we'll see you all there with the innumerable multitude in the presence of Christ forevermore. Let's pray. <coughs> Father, we cannot comprehend the height, the depth, the breadth of your grace in Christ. We rejoice in the salvation provided for us, body and soul. We thank you for our hope as believers. Already we taste the life of the age to come, and yet, Father, we know there is so much more still to come. May the hope of these things be strong within us. May it stir us to serve Christ in our love for the one who loved us and gave himself for us. And, Father, we pray we would take comfort and consolation as we think of these precious truths. And if any, Lord, should still be outside of Christ this evening, draw them, we pray, to the Saviour, that they might enter into life and share the hope of glory. We praise you as the God who is making all things new. And, Father, we praise you for your grace to us in our great Saviour. Hear us, we pray, in Jesus' name. Amen.